All right, joining us is a very special guest, Jim Kunkel, who flew P-38 Lightnings in World War II. So, Jim, we are honored to have you on the channel. Thanks for joining us. Well, I thank you. So let's go back to the early days. Uh, do the math. So if I understand it correctly, you were born in 1922. That makes you 102 years old. Coming up on two. Not oh, there okay. yet. You're just 101. You're just a lad of 101. What were your earliest influences that drove you to want to be a military pilot? My dad uh, was in World War I, and he wanted to be an aviator. Unfortunately, he was uh, involved in an accident when he was on active duty, and it affected his health, and he never could qualify for flight training. But he never lost that interest in aviation. And so he actually passed away when I was nine years old in 1932 from injuries that he had received in World War I. In the meantime, every time uh, we were out on, on a trip or something, if we went by an airport, we would stop. And frequently, my dad and I would go flying. We flew in a bunch of different Wacos and travel airs and all sorts of things. So I never lost that interest in, in aviation. I wanted to be a, uh, an Air Force or Air, Army Air Corps fighter pilot. Just hung on to that desire. You started out in Pennsylvania, then you moved to California. You were at Beverly Hills High School when Pearl Harbor happened, is that correct? Well, actually, I was out. I, I was in the class of 1940. And uh, in the meantime, the war started in September 1939 in Europe. I was a senior. And so I thought, you know, I better get some experience. So I, I went out for my senior year at Beverly High. I went out and joined the California Air National Guard. And um, I was kind of recruited by a fellow by the name of Orv Muller, who was a hero of mine. He was All-American at USC in the earlier 30s. And so I met him. I'd work out at Grand Central Air Terminal, which was the air terminal really serving Los Angeles. It was in Glendale, California. So I'd go out there and work on Saturdays and sometimes on Sundays, washing the airplanes and trying to get a ride, maybe a 15-minute uh, instruction flight. Irv found out I was interested in, in the Army Air Corps, so he was a pilot trained by the Air Guard in Griffith Park, where the Guard actually had an airfield in the park. What was your path from the Guard to flying P-38s? Because I know there was a period in the middle there where you were actually building P-51s. So tell us about that. I was in the Guard up through uh, 1940. We were on maneuvers in Washington, and I actually missed my uh, a good part of my senior uh, social life uh, being with the Guard. But we were up in uh, Fort, near Fort Lewis. We were attacking Fort Lewis. It, it became very apparent that we were not very well equipped. We had a bunch of bulls. Uh, no, well, they were in good shape, but they were O38 built by Douglas in the early 30s. And we received a couple of brand new O47 North Americans from the factory. And so I was a tail gunner. In September 1940, when we came back from maneuvers, they federalized the Air Guard, and I wasn't old, old enough, 18, to go without my parents' or my mother's signature. So she said uh, she wanted me to stay in school. I was starting college to get my two years and be 21 years of age and go through the cadet program. The summer of 1941, I worked at North American Aviation through the help of uh, people who had been in the Guard who were executives at North American. And I earned 35 cents an hour and worked all summer out on the line on the first 10 P-51s built. And they were built for the RAF, eight of them, and two of them were built for the Army Air Corps and went 
were sent back to right field. So at the end of the summer of 40, I went, was ready to go back to school. And uh, I was used to making all that money of the 35 cents an hour. That was uh, good money back in those days, right? I was working with people that were uh, taking care of four kids and a family on that 35 cents an hour. So anyway, I went to Lockheed, uh, who had a graveyard shift. So I could uh, go to work at midnight, get off at 7, and I could be in class at 8.30. Uh, I started out that way, and of course, I, was, I worked all the winter of 1941, and I was there at Lockheed when, they, when the war started and was involved in the um, first big blackout and the, the raid on on Los Angeles, where they blacked out the whole city and blacked out the plant. I was down at 7th and Santa Fe, downtown Los Angeles, in the old warehouse building that Lockheed had, and they built the boom sections and wings for the P-38. So I was on the 38 line all during the winter. Uh, when the war started, they dropped the age limit uh, very quickly to 18 and a, and a high school uh, graduation. And so I immediately, along with 500,000 kids that wanted to be fighter pilots, joined the cadet program and signed up and was sworn in. So was that the spring of 42 when you did that? Spring of 42. And uh, I ha I waited. I thought, gosh, the war's going to be over before I get into it. But uh, I finally got sworn in in, in uh, September of 42. And uh, then I still had to wait. Santa Ana was being built, and that was the reception center to Santa Ana, California, for the West Coast. So I had to wait to my turn to be called up. So I was actually born in Santa Ana. Oh, my dad you? my dad was a Marine Corps attack pilot at El Toro, oh. flying A-4s when I was born in 1959. It's somewhat serendipitous that you're building P-38s before you get in the pipeline to fly P-38s. So did that give you some insights as to the engineering and mechanics that made you a better P-38 pilot? Oh, yes. When I was called up as a cadet, they had asked you, well, what's your preference? Not that you're going to get it, but um, my preference was I wanted to go to England and I wanted to fly P-38s. And that's the way it worked out. So basically two major units, the 9th and the 8th. The 8th was doing bomber escort seeing a lot of air-to-air -air action, that those guys were getting all the, the kills, and the ninth wasn't quite into that. And so when you got orders to the ninth, you were a little bit disappointed at first. Well, yeah, I was a little disappointed. I had actually spent a lot of my time figuring uh, uh, leads on a 100 mil site, and I followed the... Uh, uh, some of the information I received from a gentleman called Screwball Burling, who was RAF and was the hero of Malta during the defense of Malta. And he was probably one of the greatest deflection gunnery pilots in, in the world. I mean, he, he knew his angles of attack. I heard all about this, and so I, I studied up on him thinking, boy, air-to-air -air combat's for me. Of course, I got to England just prior to the D-Day, so the 9th Air Force is being really brought up to full strength. After a few missions, and I found out what support we could offer the ground troops. It was proven in the Battle of Normandy across the France that uh, the work of the fighter bombers was very important to our ground troop. We did deep reconnaissance, or what we called armed reconnaissance, after any transportation that, that you could find, trains, river boats, anything that would transport munitions or anything like it. Let's do a little bit of a deep dive on the P-38 and what it was like to fly. Talk to us about some of the 
both advantages of the P-38 and some of the challenges of the P-38? Well, the 38, I thought, was was a great airplane. The early 38 was a slow roller. I found that if I could kick the rudder real hard and then start my roll, it, it did help, or at least you thought it helped. But then Kelly Johnson developed the uh, aileron boost, which uh, just made an entirely different airplane out of it. You could roll with anybody. You couldn't roll over and do a split S from 20,000 feet without entering what we called compressibility, which made it almost impossible to get out of the dive. And you used your trim tab. So you could get out of the dive if you were very careful. But this is not going to get you any victories if the German is pulling out of his dive and you're still heading earthward. When the dogfights would unfold, was it just shots of opportunity? Did you have time to develop a, a game plan? Are, are you going to outturn him? Are you going to just do slashing attack because you're faster than he is? How does that work? The Luftwaffe would, took some great interest in the fighter bombers in that they would be vectored in by their radar and the first indication we had them would be on our six o'clock uh, coming in on us and we had some disastrous results with that program one of our uh, sister p-38 groups there were three of them in the ninth air force by that time and the eighth had pretty much uh, 38th were gone one of our sister uh, squadrons lost uh, half a squadron eight aircraft due to a, an attack uh, such as this. In August, we, um, we had our first one. And what we did, we'd heard that this was going on naturally. So we decided we were going to put some experience in the back, uh, uh, back flight. Number uh, three and four of the rear flight would be more experienced people that would uh, keep their eye on our on our uh, sixth position. In August, I drew the number four position. We were on a mission up in central France, and sure enough, I uh, was watching our six o'clock, and here they came. And I got a glimpse of uh, just two that were closing on me very rapidly. Uh, I broke into them called the break, and naturally, uh, you know, when you, whoever sights the aircraft first, you don't take your eyes off them. You call the break and keep your eyes on them, and, uh, and you lead the attack. And so I did all that, and all of a sudden, uh, I realized that no one followed me. So I'm in a a big turning maneuver with uh, a couple of FW-190s. I'm busy trying to find them in my uh, in my six o'clock, thinking that they were coming around behind me. And I look forward, and on a P-38, you could actually, through your gun sight, you could see the top two 50s of the four 50s in the nose and the 20-millimeter cannon. I turned around. And it looked like I had those 250s just around the rudder post of this 190. And he must have seen me about the same time I finally saw him. And I think I fired a short burst, but I'm not even sure of that. But that 190 did a flick roll on me. I probably rolled... 25 or 30 degrees, and he did a 180 and dove away from me, and uh, I was still rolling when he disappeared, which gave you a pretty good idea of uh, the capability of a 190. That went into my lesson book. The other thing about a P-38 is you had a yoke, right? You did not have a stick. That's right. And everybody is always always asking me, why did a P-38 have a, a yoke? Well, you got to remember the airplane was built to be a high altitude fighter against bombers. So the yoke 
and the design of the airplane, that nose wheel, when it retracted, actually came up right under the seat, the pilot's seat. So you had that nose wheels in the way, so you couldn't put a, a central stick in the airplane the way it was designed. Personally, I like the yoke. You could two handle it, and particularly in the earlier ones, where they had a poor roll weight anyway, it took all your strength to, to roll that aileron in, and, uh, and it was helpful. So uh, I never thought of it, you know, as being a detriment to the flying quali qualities of the aircraft. The 38 had many good things about it. The counter-rotating props, you know, they reversed them. The first one, they, they rotated in towards the pilot himself, and they found that the airplane flew a heck of a lot better if you rotated them out, but that made both of your engines critical engines if you lost one. You know, the plus factors on the airplane, it was maybe a little harder to fly, uh, the techniques of flying it. I, I think you had to love the airplane to really get to know it. So as the ground forces, Big Red One and, and other uh, well-known storied units are moving eastward after the initial landing, you're operating out of the first base right there at Omaha Beach, right? Yes, we were at A1, built on a dairy farm about uh, halfway between uh, Omaha Beach and Point the Hawk. We stayed in England for a period almost a month after D-Day. Uh, our first airfield that, for the 370th fighter group which I was a part of in the 401st Squadron, was going to be San Lo. You know, we didn't take San Lo to until uh, well after the, uh, the invasion. Prior to that time, we, uh, we split up the 370th group, and each squadron of the three squadrons in the group, our 401st Squadron went to A1, which was the primary field for the P-47s of the 366th fighter group. So we shared the airfield with them. Our other two squadrons went to two other airfields and shared. So uh, for about, oh, probably close to six weeks, we operated off of Bay one uh, right at Omaha. So most of your hops are close air support, as you've described. Uh, you're going after trains, you're going after riverboats, any troop transports, whatever uh, tasking you get from the guys on the ground. ACAC -ac was a major threat. When you're down low, you got everything. They can throw rocks at you. But uh, uh, 40 millimeter and uh, uh, 20s were particularly bad because of the volume of fire. Uh, the Germans were very, very proficient with their 88s. I've been in a dive bombing run where you get three shots right off the end of your wing. They aren't lined up on you, but they're sure on your altitude, and you're in a run. 88s were something to be reckoned with. Uh, anything above, uh, say, four or 5,000 feet, the 88 was very effective. About three-plus months after the D-Day landing, you had a very fateful mission, specifically on September 16th, 1944. So walk us through that day. We were operating out of Roy Amy, which was uh, north of Paris. It had been a permanent French facility, and the Luftwaffe really improved it and had wonderful runways and everything. It had been heavily damaged, but when the Germans moved out, we moved in. We had a mission uh, to go up to near uh, uh, in northern Germany, and we were on the way in. And it, on the 16th of, of September, the First Army 16th Infantry Regiment had moved in, and they were attacking Aachen. And the controller called us and uh, changed our mission. And we were uh, we had two squadrons who were bombed up and strafing. They went down and were working at low altitude. 
Our squadron stayed up to act as talk cover for them. Thinking back of this German uh, uh, tactic of uh, being vectored in, and again, I had drawn that uh, that rear position, and I had lost my wingman, so I'm back there by myself, and uh, uh, as the third member of the flight, and uh, I'm watching our six o'clock, and sure enough, here come two different gaggles, about 45 degrees apart, coming in on our position. And I very carefully called the break. I saw them, called the break, and I broke into them. Almost immediately, I got fire from over my shoulder. I, I had picked the group to the left. I immediately got fire from the rear position. So I just, the thought entered my mind that I'm, I'm in the same position I was about two or three weeks earlier. I'm facing enemy aircraft, but I've got somebody on my tail already. So I know the squadron's not behind me. There was a big dogfight, and uh, there seemed like there were numerous targets. And I'd line up on one and and uh, try to get to fire at them, and I'd be hit from behind again. So it seemed like this went on for a long time. I was right on the tail of a 190, and I'm firing at it. And I was very concerned over the amount of ammunition that I was using. You know, we didn't have a whole lot. We had 400 rounds for the each 50 and 130 rounds for the 20 millimeter. So, so you've got a few seconds there of flying, so I'm concerned over these bursts that I've been firing. And I sure as heck didn't want to run out. And out of the corner of my eye, I'm, we're in a fairly tight turn, and I'm getting 20 millimeter hits on my left wing. And this guy on my tail, he just walked it right up, and he hit in the center section between the engine nacelle and the pilot nacelle on the left side. And there was a cold air vent that came in at your knee. Uh, the only cold air vent in the cockpit, really. And all of a sudden, that cold air vent in my peripheral vision was looking like a, a blowtorch. Instantly, it seemed a microsecond later, I think the airplane blew up. I don't even remember reaching for the emergency release on the canopy top, which was above your forehead. I was in the airplane, and an instant later, I'm falling through a cloud, and I knew the clouds were around 5,000 feet. We'd been kind of yo-yoing up and down through the cloud layer. I came out the bottom, and I was falling face up. So I rolled over, and I thought, sure, uh, I, I knew we were northeast of Aachen. Uh, we didn't have any report of a bomb line up there or a line where our infantry is uh, is operating, so I thought I was over German territory. So I rolled over and watched the ground came coming up at me, and I'd seen far from the uh, from other folks that were in shoots from the ground. So I delayed my drop as long as I I could. Finally pulled the rip cord. And that shoot no more open, and then I got some 20 millimeter from the ground. And that just kind of indicated that yeah, I was behind the German line. I came down in a courtyard of a red brick building, and the courtyard had a tree in the middle of it. And my chute hung up in the tree. In the meantime, in that last maybe 100 feet or so, I was trying to get my 45 and a shoulder holster out and charge it, and I dropped it, and uh, not realizing that my hands were pretty badly burned, I got out of the shoe, and I got out uh, outside, and I was there was a ditch and some landscaping, thinking I'd been on the ground for quite a while because of not being able to see very well. I didn't realize my face and and. Uh, 
and the hands were pretty badly burned. But I saw some infantry guys, and I thought they were German first, and then I could see their bucket helmet, and they had net on it, and our guys looked like that, not wanting to be caught with a 45 in my hand. I threw my hands up and and, uh, threw the 45 over my shoulder and never saw it again. These guys picked me up and took me back to an aid station. So it turned out the 1st Infantry had moved up the uh, night before and taken that village. So I came down between the German positions and the 1st Infantry 16th Regiment divisions. They sent a group out, picked me up, and took me to the aid station. I was sent to the American Hospital in Paris. And I I was taken into the ward, and I no more entered the ward. And this guy comes up to me and says, hell, I know you. We picked you up. And uh, he was a second lieutenant in the 16th Regiment, Company C. And he had been hit right after they picked me up. His name was Leonard Scott. And Leonard had quite a history behind him. He'd been with the 1st Infantry Division since the North African campaign, had been sent to England, made D-Day with the 1st Division. That wound he got uh, right after they picked me up was his seventh Purple Heart. And he also had a Distinguished Service Cross that Patton had given him down in, uh, in Sicily. And so Leonard and I stayed together for quite a while uh, in the hospital, and we were transferred to England to the Netley Hospital in uh, in Southampton, England, and we were together. Yeah, funny. I asked Leonard Scott why he was still a second lieutenant. He'd been a second lieutenant from the time that uh, he he uh, made the landings in North Africa, and. We weren't in that Netley Hospital two hours from France, and this real pretty nurse shows up with Leonard's Class A uniform, and we didn't see him for 10 days. I don't think anybody looked real hard for him. So when he got finally got back to the hospital, I asked him, how many times have you been a, a first lieutenant before you became a second lieutenant again? But uh, he was quite a character. Finally, I got out of the hospital, and I wanted to go back to squadron. And so uh, when you got out of the hospital, they they gave you a uniform. And usually it was something that they'd taken off of a not-too-badly-wounded casualty, sewn up the holes, and there was GI, the old wool, shade 33, uniform. No, no insignia, no nothing. I found the cap, and so I'm heading. Uh, I went and got down to London, got a flight to Paris, landed in Paris, and I didn't have any money from the hospital. And so uh, uh, I went out. I decided, well, I'm going to see some of Paris, and I went to the Lido Club. And... Uh, I came out of the Lido Club, and I ran into about half a dozen of my squadron mates. And not only did I find them, and they were glad to see them, but I also noticed that the, they were wearing some of my uniforms. So so uh, at least I got some clothing, <laughs> borrowed some money, got a room at the... Uh, at the Cambridge Hotel, which was right by the Lido Club. And so when they had transportation coming in to take them back to the squadron, I went with them. And I, I got back to the squadron, and I thought, boy, I'm in. I would be back on flying duty and uh, all set. In fact, uh, that evening, they showed me a brand-new P-38 that they just brought in from Northern Ireland where Lockheed did all the modifications on them before they were sent out to the combat groups. And uh, it was a beautiful airplane and it was going to be all mine. Next day I get up and uh, 
I make breakfast, and the, our flight surgeon comes to me, and he says, you know, he says, I don't like the way you're walking. He says, we're going to go into the, the uh, we were up at, uh, in Belgium at that time, and he said, we're going into Shalloway, and you're going to the hospital with me this morning. So I went in, they took some pictures, and next thing you know, I had a cast on my back, and I'm back in the hospital again. Uh, they decided I'd done something to my back in the fourth lumbar. Well, were you in pain or anything, or was it just he didn't like the way you were walking? He didn't like the way I was walking, and I, and I was in pain. I, I felt like I'd been beat with a with a uh, two by four, but uh, you know it wasn't that bad. And uh, I really uh, wanted to get back with the squad. So anyway, back to the hospital I go, and I end up in the third medical establishment in Paris, and they could have sent me home, but I convinced them. I said, just give me a rest. So what they did is they sent me to a flak house, which were mainly for the bomber crews in England. They were run by the Red Cross, and, you know, it was easy living. So usually they'd send the bomber crews down there for a week, maybe 10 days, and give them a break. But they sent me there for 30 days, and I sat in that black place for 30 days. Nobody to talk to. The bomber crews didn't like to talk about combat. Fighter pilots did. And so... Uh, I'm sitting in that thing, and I decide that this isn't this is a waste of time. Well, is it is it called Flak House because it's a, a sort of break from the flak? Is that what that means? Yes, that's why they call them Flak Houses. They were for the bomber crews, and this one this was a beautiful place. Uh, it was right on the Thames River, and they had boats, and they had all kinds of recreational stuff. But I. Uh, I had a little trick. I, I knew how to write orders. And so I write an order in the morning uh, requesting uh, four hours of flight time to keep. You know, we had to fly four hours a month to get flight pay. So this was very common. And so I'd uh, write an order for four hours and I'd go down and find a, a an airport station that had some equipment, and I'd get four hours flying time. What kind of airplane? Anything that flew. Now, Avro Ansons that were built by the British. Uh, I actually got to fly a Spitfire. So you could just jump in whatever they had and go flying. That's the way it was. In fact, that's the way the RAF ran it. You know, those, those little gals that ferried those airplanes, they had little cards tell them how to get the airplane started, and then they flew them. So my 30 days were up, and now it's uh, we're into December. I got to uh, London, and I'm trying to get a ride on ATC, Air Transport Command, to Paris. I'm going back to the squadron again. I couldn't get across the channel, so I went down to Southampton and got on a... Uh, a troop ship that had just come in from the U.S. with four hospital units on board, general hospital units. All these real nice nurses and everything. New Year's Eve, uh, I was with this nurse this nursing group, and we had quite a party on the way to uh, La Havre, France. We got there just right after a torpedo attack by some e boat German e-boats. And so uh, that was a nice way to spend New Year's Eve. Now I'm back in Paris again, and I'm at the American Hospital. I found my way back to the squadron, and this time I thought I could make it stick. The flight surgeon was not happy at all about the fact that I was back there. And uh, I got orders to go to uh, General Spots' headquarters. And I was told it was a decoration ceremony. Uh, I think they told me what uh, Distinguished Service Cross. I didn't know what a Distinguished Service Cross was. I had to 
find the book and look it up and see what, what, what on earth they were talking about. So anyway, I went down to Paris and I met uh, General Spots' aide, who was the Brigadier General, and uh, we had a very nice conversation. He said, why weren't you sent home? And I said, well, I really wanted to go back to the squadron. Can you fix me up? And he said, yeah, I can fix you up. And uh, he did. I went back to the squadron, and he fixed me up. All right, I had orders to go home. So uh, in January, uh, this is now well into January, 45, I went down to uh, Bristol and got on the Wakefield, which was the old liner Manhattan, which would have been converted to a troop carrier. And she she made the run solo, just like the uh, the British uh, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth did. So I came home. So, Jim, you are the personification of the greatest generation. Let me thank you for your service and thank you for spending this time with us today. And thank you. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thank you.